And oh, the merry, merry dance, the music loud it rose. To the wind it shakes, the barley shook, the sorrow from my soul. Then Kitty, dark-eyed Kitty, let out shun the fairest queen. To the rocky road, to double and tilt with me upon the green. I've known this song for a long time, but it was only recently that I learned its proper name. In 1983, my brother gave me a homemade cassette copy of a 1978 album by the Irish folk band Ferdia. was given the cassette by a friend. I'd no idea what the album was called, but there was one song of eight verses that fired my imagination. The song about my home county, County Tyrone, was one in which the tune danced in perfect step with the words. God be with the good old times when I was twenty one, and Tyrone among the bushes where the men and all were wrong. When my heart was gay and merry wrecked, now then the fair toil. Listen as the bells of Derry ringing o'er the boil. When lightsome as the summer breeze, I was so terrible. In an attempt to learn it, I played it over and over again. But such was the quality of the homemade recording, I could only make out some of the words. Along with my fellow Bacan band member, Paul McAree, we sang it as God Be With The Good Old Times When I Was 21 on a television show in 1987. Oh God be with the good old times when I was twenty-one And her own among the bushes where I walked and used to run And so I say and fondly praise who sings my setting song May God be with the good old times when I was twenty-one When I finally got the original Ferdia album in September 2017 I discovered that the song and indeed the album was called A Sigh for Old Times According to the sleeve notes the words to A Sigh for Old Times were written by William Collins. Jim Bradley of Straband passed the poem on to Leon Tourish of Ferdia, then Leon added original music. The album included another Collins poem, The Soldiers of Maryland, again with music by Leon Tourish. But just who was William Collins? <laughs> to his friends as Billy, William Collins was born in 1838 in Straban, County Tyrone. From a staunchly Irish nationalist background, his father Thomas supported the activities of a new group of Irish revolutionaries, the Young Irelanders, who in 1848 launched a rebellion against British rule in the southeast of Ireland. Thomas and his wife, both of whom were from the province of Munster, told the young William of the heroic deeds of Cúchulainn, of the United Irishmen of 1798, of speeches made by young Irelanders John Mitchell and Thomas Francis Maher. Indeed, the Collins home, a hub of revolutionary activity, was described as a sort of rendezvous for many of the northern nationalists of the time, some of whom became prominent in Irish politics at a later period. The nationalist newspaper The Nation co-founded and edited by the poet and young Irelander Thomas Davis, became a key source of news for the Collins family. Unlike some of his boyhood friends, William Collins learned to read and write, disciplines which he would hone and excel at in later life. When a travelling salesman from Castle Finn in Donegal was peddling his wares in Straban and met young William, he gave him the welcome gift of a book of poems by Thomas Davis. One of William's earliest memories was from 1848, when, as a ten-year-old boy, he and his friends pretended to be young Irelanders by fashioning make-believe muskets from sticks, forming an improvised marching band and parading around Straban, striking up the Wearing of the Green or the Shan Van Vocht.
Following the ravages of the Irish famine and the failed rebellion, the adventurous teenage William saw little hope of a future in Ireland. Running away from home in 1852, he joined thousands of others and boarded one of the many emigrant ships bound for the New World. Arriving in Quebec, Canada some weeks later, he made his way to Ottawa, where he worked for a few years as a farmhand before travelling to Arnprior in Upper Ottawa, where he found employment as a farmer and as a logger. The poems of Thomas Davis were never far from his mind. While living in Arnprior, Collins pursued his passion for writing poetry, his skills attracting the attention of some Canadian and Irish-American journals. At the outbreak of the American Civil War in 1861, he moved to Cleveland, Ohio and joined the Union Army. When the war ended in 1865, he joined the ranks of the Fenian Brotherhood, an American version of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, more commonly known as the Fenians. The 27-year-old Straban man became inspired by the patriotic zeal of John O'Neill, a Fenian general from County Monaghan who arrived in America in 1848 and fought on the Union side during the Civil War. When it became evident that O'Neill intended to strike a symbolic blow for Irish freedom by attacking British colonial forces in Canada, William Collins was one of approximately 100,000 Fenians who enlisted in O'Neill's army. In May 1866, the Fenians made camp in Buffalo on the American-Canadian border. When word of their approach reached the British governors, they called on Canadian recruits loyal to Britain to destroy what they described as this lawless and piratical band. On the 2nd of June, 850 troops from the Queen's Own Rifles, or Redcoats, led by Lieutenant Alfred Booker, came face to face with the Fenians at Lime Ridge, or Limestone Ridge, near Ontario. Booker's inexperienced soldiers found themselves confronted with O'Neill's fearless men, battle-hardened by the American Civil War. <laughs> Yelling, attacking, firing and hoisting flags bearing a Fenian sunburst insignia and another bearing an image of a harp with the words Irish Republican Army emblazoned on it. Booker's forces were outmaneuvered outflanked and left with little option but to retreat. Nine redcoats were killed in the battle. Fenian dead numbered six. The following day, when the Fenians poured across the border into the United States, US officials confiscated their weapons before letting them go free. O'Neill's army, their sympathisers in America and the Irish Republican Brotherhood in Ireland saw the battle as nothing short of a morale-boosting victory the entire story receiving ample coverage in the press. But how did Collins remember events? Well, in his 11-verse poem, The Battle of Limestone Ridge, he perhaps indulged in poetic license by stating that there were 400 men in O'Neill's ranks and 1,600 in Booker's. In vain, in vain, on field and plain, like stricken deer they fly. Our bullets speed, they sink and bleed and stagger, fall and die. The field is red and piled with dead and flashing in the sun. The sunburst waves above their graves and Limestone Ridge is won. In a subsequent interview with the Irish-American journalist and publisher Patrick Donahoe, Collins spoke of how the English military authorities had court-martialed Booker for cowardice. I could not believe, he added, that Englishmen could have proved themselves such cowardly runaways if I were not an eyewitness to the fact. He also expressed his distaste of American President Andrew Johnson for attempting to stifle further Fenian attacks against the English on Canadian soil. In spite of his opinion of the American President, there is little doubt that Collins was settling into the New World as a proud Irish-American, ever mindful of County Tyrone's role in the making of the United States. Indeed, it was Straban-born John Dunlap 
who printed the American Declaration of Independence in 1776, which included signatories Thomas Nelson and Thomas McKean, both of whom were from Straban. Having settled back to civilian life in Cleveland, Collins applied himself to writing more poems, some of which were published in the local press. Though the main emphasis of his writing focused on Irish historical themes, he also immortalised in print personal memories of Straban and its surrounding areas. He wrote of the Finn River, the Mourne River, Crochan Hill, Curly Hill, Knocknavo, and the townlands of Ernie and Clon Lee. In 1874, he left Cleveland to take up a job as a member of the editorial staff with the popular New York-based newspaper, The Irish World and American Industrial Liberator, which was founded by Patrick Ford, a political activist and journalist from County Galway. Within months, Collins's literary prowess attracted the gaze of P.J. Kennedy, an Irish-speaking, New York-born publisher of mostly Catholic works. In December 1875, Kennedy published Ballads, Songs and Poems, a collection of musings by Collins which Kennedy divided into three sections, Rappery or Outlaw, Historical and Legendary and Irish American. Spanning almost 360 pages and including the Battle of Limestone Ridge, the poems mainly concentrated on the heroism of Irishmen doing battle in Ireland, America and Canada. Critics were divided on the work. A reviewer for the Shamrock Journal remarked that Collins did not have the impassioned energy of Thomas Davis or the soft sweetness of Sir Thomas Moore and urged the poet to ease up on conflict and say something, anything, of love. Collins, he said, offers the reader no relief from perpetual warfare, no change from the roll of the drum and the shock of battle or from the sudden surprise or the sweeping revenge. The Morning Star and Catholic Messenger recorded, We do not know who Mr. Collins is, but the book before us is convincing proof that the author is an Irishman, whose heart is full of Ireland's sufferings, and whose hand, unable to bear a sword, is at least determined to wield a pen in defense of his country's cause. His poems are replete with blood and thunder, and his lines are at times wanting in the delicacy and sweetness of true poetry. But in spite of their fiery nature, we can recommend them to our Catholic youth as affording some fine subjects for school or parlor declamation. In spite of such criticism, sales of ballads, songs and poems would increase in the ensuing years. It has had a fair sale, the publisher Patrick Donahue later remarked. It's still in demand in the United States and elsewhere. From April to October 1876, a selection of Collins's poems were published in Young Ireland, a Dublin-based bi-monthly magazine. In the introduction to one of his poems, Hamilton's Leap, he wrote of how this Straban landmark acquired its name. It was, he said, named after an Irish gentleman and soldier who, when ambushed by Cromwell soldiers in the Glen of Straban, jumped with his horse off the precipice rather than succumb to capture. While in New York, Collins lived with his wife and daughter at 531 Myrtle Avenue in Brooklyn. Little is known of his family except to say that he and his wife had other children who died when young, causes of death unknown. He shared the home with four cats, Johnny, Butsy and Swing. He named the other McSwiggin, a popular family name in and around Straban. In Myrtle Avenue he wrote short stories for The Lamp Journal, and set about writing four novels about Ireland, Sibylla, A Tale of the County Tyrone, The Wild Geese, Desmond, A Tale of Two Flags, and Dalaradia. In 1882, P.J. Kennedy published Dalaradia, an historical novel set in 5th century Ireland. The other novels, however, remained in manuscript form, their present whereabouts unknown. On the morning of July 2nd, 1888, Union Army veterans from the Irish Brigade who fought at the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863 gathered around a newly erected Celtic cross in Gettysburg War Cemetery. 
After the stirring speeches were delivered and solemn songs were sung, Collins mounted the podium and recited a poem specially written to mark the day. In memory of the fallen dead of the Irish Brigade began, Peace spreads her wings of snowy white over Gettysburg today. Published in countless newspapers throughout America, it was described as one of his best poetic productions. Though Patrick Donahoe never thought that Collins' literary ability matched that of his fellow Tyrone writer William Carlton, he saw Collins as a generous, good-natured man who was not interested in chasing the muck of money, but in the pursuit of freedom. Patriotism was his passion, said Donahoe. The death of his only surviving daughter in January 1890 left Collins a broken man. Becoming somewhat of a recluse, he died on February 4th, 1890 and was buried at the Holy Cross Catholic Cemetery, Flatbush, Long Island. He was 52. Patrick Donahoe appealed to the readership of his Donahoe's magazine to send donations in order to defray the cost of funeral expenses, to place an engraved headstone over the grave and to support Mrs Collins in her hour of need. By way of encouraging readers to contribute, Donahoe printed the names of six New York newspaper journalists and editors who had donated the total sum of $42, nearly $1,100 in today's money. Three weeks later, the Tyrone Constitution newspaper announced the death of the Straban poet and printed a brief obituary. In December 1890 and in 1896, P.J. Kennedy republished Collins's Dalaradia. A few years later, a 35-year-old solicitor and antiquarian from Tyrone, Alexander Albert Campbell, set about compiling a literary history of what he called an old Straban town. Campbell, who was then practising law in Waring Street, Belfast, wanted, he said, to rescue from oblivion the names of those who had an impact on the literary world. Published in 1902 by the Tyrone Constitution, Campbell's book featured a sketch of Collins's life and included all eight verses of A Sigh for Old Times. Oh God be with the good old times when I was twenty-one And Tyrone among the bushes where the men and all were wrong When my heart was gay and merry wrecked, now then the fair toil Less sung as the bells of Derry ringing over the boil as years went by, rumours abounded that William Collins was the first to refer to his native county as Tyrone Among the Bushes, as featured in the second line of A Sigh for Old Times. Edith Wheeler used the phrase as the title to one of her poems in 1903, and in 1933 it became the title of a book by Lydia M. Foster. But if we go back as far as 1845, we see it appear in The Legend of Nokmani, a short story included in a book called Tales and Sketches of the Irish Peasantry. The author, William Carlton. Having listened to stories of rebellion as a boy and having fought as a soldier on American and Canadian soil, William Collins laid down his sword and took up the pen. Perhaps he is best remembered as the warrior bard of Straban. <laughs>